Next on BYUSN, one month of Big 12 games are in the books for men's basketball. Are the Cougars on schedule through January? And what would be a good record in February? We'll ask BYU basketball alum Dalton Nixon those questions and discuss the similarities between this year's team and the 2019-20 BYU team. Plus, BYU football's director of player personnel, Justin Anderson, gives us the latest from the Shrine and Senior Bowls after his visits this week. And Top 5 Thursday features the top wins against Texas. I'll take that anytime. Welcome to BYU Sports Nation, presented by the BYU Store, official outfitter of BYU fans everywhere. It is Thursday, February 1st. I am Spencer Linton. He is a man who knows all about delays, specifically at BYU women's basketball games. Uh, I, I can't recall one in my particular life, but uh, yesterday apparently there was a bat that flew into the BYU Kansas game. And I kept Fog waiting for Manu Ginobili to come in and yeah. save the day. And then uh, you know for Peta to freak out, uh, which they did after that. But li- listen and watch what happened last night at the game. Here's Jason Shepard riding into the front court, out wide to Smiler. Smy backs it out, and there is a bird. No, is that, that's a bat. There's a bat flying around near the court. And on the other end, BYU takes advantage of maybe everybody looking at the bat. And Rose finds Gustin for the easy layup. And now the bat just hit Nichols in the head flying around. Now everybody's starting to get a little freaked out because of the bat on the floor. Wow. It looked like a bird. But then it became pretty evident it was a bat. And it's hovering about two feet above the floor. It's not getting any higher than that. And it's just flying around the KU logo. <laughs> that is, oh, that's that is wild. Nice call by Shep of the, uh, the bat timeout there. Absolutely. Wow. They, and credit to the PA announcer at the Jayhawks arena at Fog Allen Fieldhouse because about one minute after that, they started playing, like, different batman theme nice, songs. Nice. Oh, it, it was fantastic. you gotta, you got to have some fun with it. I don't, yeah. think they, I don't think they, like, there was official word that they caught the bat. It just I kind of, no like, idea. flew to the rafters, and they were like, okay, I, I think we're good. Let's just, let's just keep playing. it doesn't come back. Holy cow. One time, one of those, uh, like, patio umbrellas that you kind of wind up and close, I opened mine at, like, the beginning of spring yeah. one year, and a bat fell out and then flew away. That's terrifying. Yeah, I was like, did anyone? Else? I went inside like a bat was in the. They're like, no. I was like, I, I promise. It was crazy. Is it like that episode of The Office where if it touches you, you have to get a rabies shot? Like, is that a requirement? I don't know if that's actual, like requirement. I don't know that. <laughs> I don't know the answer to that. Yeah. On that important note, and with Batman on the mind, all rise and shout. It's time for what's trending. Find Khalifa back door again. Waterman caught a body. Now, here you go. Pull up on the base, and he scores it. Jackson is feeling it. And the alley of Hammer Hall. And one again for Dallin Hall. Rise is an operative word for BYU basketball from last year to this year. And we can apply that to the great Batman movies. The Dark Knight. Yeah, BYU Rises. men's basketball on the rise overall from non-conference to Big 12 play and certainly in their metrics and their rankings. So at this juncture of the season, as we open a new month, happy February, by the way, is BYU men's basketball, Jerem, ahead of, behind, or right on schedule through the first month of Big 12 games specifically? Now, BYU went 12-1 and in non-conference play. This adjusted expectations. That was unbelievable. Right? Um, because they were so good through non-conference. I say on schedule. Now, if you just see three and four and think BYU is behind schedule, you, you clearly haven't paid attention to how tough the Big 12 is. BYU is doing great. Three and four is tremendous. Remember, this is a group that went, took fifth place in the WCC last year. Like right now, they are competing well in the Big 12, which is great. So um, I say on schedule, you've got a top 10 net win in Iowa State. You got a quad two win over Texas, but the perception is that's like a quad one, right? You have a road quad one win at UCF. You're five and five in quad one and two combined, which is awesome. Lenardi has you as a five seed. This all screams fantastic. I say on schedule. Certainly. And at one and two, we sat here in this studio and asked, okay, what does BOA need to do through the remainder of January to be like, that was a good record. You're on schedule. And I said three and four. And they picked it up. They got a huge win against Texas to bring order to a little bit of chaos that was 
kind of circling among BYU fans of, oh, man, they can't drop two and five. They can't lose three in a row. BYU, they, they didn't. They're good enough. They, the metrics are showing that they are good enough to compete in and win multiple games in the Big 12. They're right on schedule. January is going to be a little bit tougher than February is, or February will be, I should say. Just by percentages of what BYU is going to face on a nightly basis, the eight opponents in February, they are not as good as collectively the group of seven teams that BYU faced in January. Not saying that it's not going to be difficult. It's, every game is a grinder for sure, starting with this Saturday against West Virginia, who just beat Cincinnati last night. Yeah. You missed that? Like, West Virginia, they play well on their home floor, and they took care of a Cincinnati team that beat BYU in Provo. Everybody but Oklahoma State plays well on their home floor. Yes. BYU's not. And they won their one against West Virginia. BYU's not overlooking anybody. No, not at all. February should be a little easier, and we'll get to that in just a moment. But as as for January, right on schedule, three and four, you have 15 wins on the season. Can we just remember where BYU was at this time last year? The Cougars had just lost three straight WCC games, including a heartbreaker to St. Mary's, I know. But they were 14-10, and 10, and they had a losing record in the WCC at 4-5. and five. They played four more games than Be- right now? Because, yeah. yeah. I mean, for whatever reason, that's how the schedule shook out. And they started WCC play earlier, right, they get typically. To the early. Right, compared to the Big 12. You don't have to play a Monday-Tuesday uh, championship semi thing. Exactly. Yeah. B- in a lesser league. BYU was 14 and 10 and had a they were 4 and 5 in WCC play at yeah. this date last year. What a rise this has become. So I, I almost am tempted to say, yeah, well they're on schedule, but man, it, it, they're, they're playing with so much house money. It feels like they're just overall just way ahead of schedule based on expectations going into the season. But that again, that's oh, not, into the season, yeah. That's not the question. The question is through Big 12 play, where are they? Right. In before the season, I would have said ahead. The fact that BYU got – because we were like – before the season, we were like, are they going to get four or five wins in Big 12? No, no, no. They're going to get seven, eight, nine, who knows, right? Somewhere in that. But, yeah, so far, so good. Um, and you see what, what BYU has done so far. Like, best win, Iowa State. Second best win, probably Texas, maybe San Diego State. So, yeah, BYU is doing well in Big 12 play. And uh, now we move on to the games in February, which brings us to topic two. What would be a good record for BYU men's hoops in the February eight games? Let's talk about those eight first. At West Virginia Saturday, at Oklahoma, home Kansas State, home UCF, at Oklahoma State, home Baylor, at Kansas State, at Kansas. Well, again, because of how February shakes out, and you just look at like win odds for BYU based on the Ken Pomeroy Index. Full screen. And ESPN's Basketball Power Index. You tell me that BYU shouldn't be in a better position to have a winning record in February. BYU is given an 84% chance to beat West Virginia. That's a Ken Palm number. 81% from ESPN. Even the Oklahoma game. It's a 50-50 game on the road. Wow. BYU comes home to take on Kansas State. 86% chance to win that game. Followed by a second consecutive home game against UCF, who you already beat on the road, 87% chance to win that game. Jerem, if the numbers hold true because they are so overwhelmingly in favor of BYU, you would think you'd go 3-1 and one in those four games. You'd think. Then BYU plays at Oklahoma State. And to your point, Oklahoma State's not been great on their home floor. You have to win that one. 83% chance to win that game in Stillwater. You come home, take on a Baylor team you were very competitive with when you played in Waco, but lost. Baylor's good, but they've lost three in a row. Kansas State is not as good as we thought they were early in Big 12 They're play. They're sliding. Yep. 70% chance to win that game on the road. That'd be amazing. And then How about that number? looking at Fog Allen Fieldhouse <laughs> and thinking, okay, what kind of chances do BYU have 45? to win this game? 45? What in the world? Are you kidding me? That's almost a coin flip game. Metrics wow. based. I know, and I know how all of you feel. You're like, yeah, 45% of Kansas, that should be like 15%. Because Kansas is so good and the name brand is so strong. And, like, it's a death trap. Fog Allen Fieldhouse is a death trap. Just they like have Hilton. bats in the gym. <laughs> just like Hilton is at Iowa State. Those yeah. teams don't lose at home typically. Rarely. But BYU's been so good by the numbers, even through seven games of Big 12 play. Like, February shakes out nice. So, Jeremy, I'm leaning 5-3, and three, and BYU – that would mean they're eight and seven going into the final three Big Twelve games of March. I think BYU should mm, win five nice. of the next eight games. Where do you stand in the February conversation? The metrics are still super high on BYU. 
Um, for me, the reality is four and four. If okay. you go four and four, phone foe, then you walk into March with seven wins, which kind of is that minimum threshold of like being on the bubble, feels like. And then if you can get one more, it feels like you would probably be in. Sure. And uh, you have Oklahoma March. State and TCU as and well as a road game at Iowa State in March. Yes. And so the Oklahoma State game, it's like, okay, that's at home. You have to win that, win that to end the regular season on March 9th, right? Um, yeah. Four and four to me would be tremendous. And you think about the Kansas game uh, there. That'll, that'll be fun, right? Just the opportunity to play that game. They have more Big 12 conference tournament titles then they have losses at home in that span of, like, the Bill Self era. They are Gonzaga. They don't really lose at home. But in the Big 12. They're, but they're it, the Gonzaga But in, in a legit 12. league. 100%. Like, Gonzaga, Gonzaga is awesome, but they ain't no Kansas, um, and especially this year. So, uh, in February, I, I look at the four, too. At West Virginia, I'd like that to be one. Kansas State would be the second one. UCF. At Oklahoma State, those are my four. Like, those are the four most likely. I think at Kansas State, that's a winnable game, too. Maybe that's the fifth you're talking about, right? Yes. If BYU loses uh, to Baylor at Kansas and at Oklahoma, that's, that's fine. Which, by the way, we've talked about, hey, no bad losses, no bad losses. BYU actually has a couple quad threes coming up. Um, if you lose some quad threes, that's not great. Starting with Saturday it's, against West Virginia. That is right. At West Virginia's quad three, Kansas State at home – will be a quad three. Both Oklahoma States are a quad three. So there's, there's four games sitting there that you're hoping to avoid losses in. If you can win all of those and keep that quad three perfection, uh, which BYU has right now at 2-0, and oh, that would be nice. This is what Sean Farnham was talking to us about on Tuesday when he said there are a number of games that BYU has approaching in February that they need to show up and win. They are the better team. I expect them to act like it and win those games. If they don't, then it becomes problematic. Then you start to sink down toward, okay, eight or nine season tournament. Oh, man, are they bubbly? Then BYU becomes Kansas State, who looked really good early, and they've kind of just fallen back. They've been getting blown out by some Big 12 teams. That's the one thing BYU has not done. Not been blown They've not out. been blown out by nope. anyone. Competing, which is great. Yes, that, that matters. That helps your metrics. That gives you better win probabilities. Better than that thing. For That's sure. why BYU stayed in the top six the whole time Nets been No there. doubt about it. BYU should win four of the next eight. They should. Like, if they don't win four of the next eight. Well, should is probably higher. Given the metrics, that's why you say that's, five. Right? I say five and three. I'm, I guess I guess it's like a, a baseline. Like I'm willing to play law of averages and understand that weird games are going to happen. Like I, I don't disagree with your four and four. Like wouldn't surprise me at all. In fact, I, I, it's fine. BYU if they were four and four, they'd be seven and eight going into the back three, and then it's like, all right, win one of the final three. You're eight and ten, and you're probably a six or a seven seed in the NCAA tournament. I'm convinced eight and ten gets you to at least okay. seven seed. I'm still riding, which is with, tremendous. Yeah, I'm still riding with my nine and nine. Like I'd stuck with that from the get go, and took a bunch of crap about it when BYU was one and two, and then two and four. It's like, no, wait until February. This is where BYU can really back up why I feel so confident that they can win nine games. Hopefully BYU can stay healthy because right now Ali Khalifa's knee is not in great shape. Atiki Ali Atiki's thumb, not in great shape. Yeah. Um, and, and obviously the hamstring of Foose is not fully healthy. Not to because, mention the sickness that's been flowing through the team. Yeah, and there are ebbs and flows on that one. But um, it's, it's tough with like, uh, you know, Foose's hamstring. He only played 17 minutes on, on uh, Saturday. So hopefully they can get to him him to a place where he's playing 20-ish and he and Ali can kind of split that uh, and then you get to the tourney in Kansas City and hopefully you can get at least one win to bolster the resume if not two if you get two oh man we're talking about four or five seeds. if you go. get two it feels like right let's go on to the big 12 roundup we go and the always unpredictable conference scenario <laughs> continues I feel like we need cowboy hats when we do this is that not <laughs> why not we can do uh, number 18, Baylor, beat UCF by 8, 77-69. Baylor trailed at halftime. Remember, they had been on a three-game slide. They have now have the win uh, after that. Lan- Langston Love, 24 off the bench. Ooh. You're like 4-3 and three in league, UCF 3-5. and five. Baylor hosts number 12, Iowa State Saturday. UCF hosts number 23, Oklahoma. Second game last night and the finale of the Big 12, at least for the midweek portion before a loaded slate on Saturday, featured West Virginia and Cincinnati. Cincinnati was a three-and-a-half point favorite. But it's the Mountaineers that come back and win that game 69-65. Jesse Edwards, 25 points, 10 rebounds in his first start 
since his return from injury for West Virginia. Remember that name, BYU fans. He's like 6'11 with like a 7'2 wingspan. He is a problem. The Mountaineers the are a he totally different team yep. right now than they were even one week ago because they have Jesse Edwards. He was at Syracuse. He transferred. He ran the mid, like the, the base bottom of that zone uh, at Syracuse. He is, he is a problem, honestly. Like, it's going to be hard to get to the rim for BYU. Ali Khalifa can draw him out, but Foose one-on-one will be an interesting matchup. To me, he's a type of player, and West Virginia's playing at home, that it takes the metric. I know we showed you 83%, 84% BYU should win this game. It feels like 60%. He's a basketball influencer. 100%. Good gosh. Both West Virginia and Cincinnati, 3-5. and five. BYU trying to avoid that same 3-5 and five record and put themselves truly in the middle of the pack with a win against the Mountaineers. That would take BYU to 4-4. Four and four. Yep. 22nd ranked Cougars and Mountaineers this Saturday. Cincinnati plays at number 15 Texas Tech on Saturday. You always want to know in the Eastern Times on road games. In the so I don't know what the problem is. <laughs> at UCF, let's go. I like that stat. Let's take a look at the updated Big 12 standings now Houston a top where we expect them to be there six and two my goodness they've rebounded nicely after a couple of unexpected losses early in the season they're so battle tested Texas Tech half game back as is Iowa State who just beat Kansas not too long ago the Jayhawks in fourth place one full game back of Houston. TCU is sneaky TCU's, awesome, by yes. the way. TCU is nationally like, ranked. Their metrics are good. Yeah. They're playing a good brand of basketball. BYU alone in ninth, which is the first of the the you know yeah. next next group there. Um, yeah, it'd be, it'd be nice to be on the left side of the the ledger here. Uh, Hundred percent, and you you week. can do that. For me, BYU just needs to get a split of the next two road games. Hopefully, yeah. it's against West Virginia. Avoid. And then, you see what happens against Oklahoma. Avoid three-game losing streak in any way. I'd love a three-game win streak, no, no doubt. But if you can avoid a three-game losing streak, I think that screams you're going to get a five, six, or seven. Six. If BYU's four and four NCAA. through the first eight, and they're right there with Oklahoma and Kansas State, and just a half game back of Baylor, right? This is awesome. Yeah, maybe, just maybe, the collective fan base around BYU is like, okay, now, now I'm believing. <laughs> now I am believing. <laughs> Now, now I believe yeah. everything that has been out there and the numbers that say BYU is so good because they're still, even after the big win against Texas, even after it'd be, BYU it'd has be, beaten Iowa State. It'd become the 14th article of faith, we believe. <laughs> yeah. Our question of the day, what would be a good record for BYU men's basketball in February? I say 5-3. and three. Uh, maybe that's too lofty, but I think BYU is certainly... Ain't no, that. Spence. <laughs> the only acceptable... I don't even know if there's a word to explain what eight no, no would be. No, <laughs> that's like, we're going to put you in a mental institute if you say eight no. Yeah. yeah. Platinum Sorry. level. Sorry. <laughs> Diamond too, medallion. Too much. Diamond medallion blue goggles. <laughs> <laughs> too much. Yes. Oh, John Marshawn X says, five and three would be a good record. Win all of the home games and grab wins at West Virginia and Oklahoma State. More winnable, right? Maybe you lose one of those, but you grab an at Oklahoma. Who knows? For like sure. Sometimes that might not be the worst thing, but I would like to avoid quad three losses, and there are a couple potential ones as we Some pitfalls. There are, four. There, are, there, are, there are four potential pitfalls. Yeah. No quad three losses. Come on. That'd be nice. Hashtag BYUS on X, Facebook, and Instagram to join that conversation. You can almost make up with it kind of with a quad one win, though, like at Oklahoma. So... Pick your poison, I guess, there. Yeah, Number 22 yeah. men's hoops plays at West Virginia, as we mentioned. Huge game. Saturday, you can listen to it starting at 8.30 Eastern on BYU Radio. What's the pregame? Up next, one of our favorites. It's been a minute. Wait, that time was uh, that time's off on that. But anyway. <laughs> BYU basketball alum Dalton Nixon joins us in studio. He's got a watch. We'll ask him. Yeah. Is BYU on schedule in his opinion? And who is the Dalton Nixon type player on this year's BYU squad? Yeah. Let's ask the man. This is BYU Sports Day. I think that's 5 Eastern. 5 Eastern? Yeah. <laughs> Johnson to the rim, driving dunk! And Richie oh. Saunders hammers it home with the right hand. Francis Noah. and triple, Noah. Yes! Yeah. Quick pull, fire, and oh. score! Foose by himself, and he hammers it home! <laughs> An excited or laughing Mark Durant is always a good thing. I was going to say, I wish Mark Durant would get excited during the uh, radio break. <laughs> we are live in Studio V. This is your day-to-day BYU Sports play-by-play alongside Jerem Jordan. I'm Spencer Linton. And we welcome in a guest that we haven't spoken to in the studio in quite a while. He graduated? I didn't. Indeed he did. It feels like you were just here. 
Probably Nixon. You probably graduated with high honors, too. Okay? <laughs> I'm going to bestow that upon you, even if you didn't. Bestow. Look at you. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Dalton Nixon is with us on BYU Sports Nation. Dalton, welcome back. Oh, Thanks. Man. It's always good to be back here. It's like you, you look the same. Yeah, you know, You've been try, working out. Yeah, I try, try and stay in shape. You know, you know, active. My wife pushes me a little bit, so it's good though. Have your kids already committed, or your unborn children, for that matter? Un- unborn, already, unborn already kids committed to yeah, BYU. Yeah, we've already got them locked into BYU. Awesome. So I've already had that conversation with Coach Pope. We're good to go. The Royal Blue Collective <laughs> has had that conversation yeah. as well. Awesome. For sure. Uh, I think everybody naturally want to know what's uh, what's going on in your life before we get into the the nitty gritty of BYU basketball. What what's the latest in your personal life? Yeah, so I mean, as soon as I finished up a few years ago. Um, jumped into coaching and, and running youth basketball, you know, with the club side. And so, you know, we have a handful of teams that we're running here in Utah County. And, you know, being able to coach and, and be in the gym with, with younger kids has been a, a big blessing in my life. And it's been, a, it's been awesome to be able to see this, you know, turn into something that I can do full time. So I really enjoy it, staying around the game, you know, obviously staying still close to BYU and seeing what they're doing. But life's good, so I can't complain. With who your parents are, coaching is just perfect. It was, it meant, just, it was it, meant for me. It, it was, just is. Yes. It's awesome. Okay, BYU's in the Big 12, man. This has been such a fun journey because BYU's competing well. They're playing big-time games. What's it been like to watch BYU enter this new era? Uh, I mean, first off, I'm really jealous. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it, it's really cool to see them, you know, do so well in the Big 12, to see the high expectations, to see all of the pieces come together. You know, um, when we were in the WCC, losing games, it just felt like, you know, it was the end of the world, yes. right? That's how, that's how it felt. That's what the expectations were for, for the fans. If you lost to someone that wasn't called St. Mary's or Gonzaga, it was, you know, doomsday. But I think where they're at right now is they've grown so much here in the Big 12, and they're just going to continue to get better and better, and they've proven that they can play with anyone. We've been talking about if, through the first seven games of Big 12 play, BYU is on schedule. And the schedule seemingly lightens up, and I mean, I say that so hesitantly, but it lightens up. You see some triple-digit net rankings. By, by <laughs> <Yeah>. the metrics <laughs> Finally. in February. But they're three and four. So are, are they on schedule? Are they ahead of schedule? Or do you think they're a little behind schedule with that losing mark in Big 12 play? Um, I, I think going into the season, if you were to say top 25 team at the end of January, <laughs> uh, top 10 Ken Palm. I can't even I not think, laugh. I think we're yeah. ahead of schedule here. You know, obviously it's hard because – We've had so many close games, and there's so many what-ifs. You know, what if with Cincinnati? What if with Texas Tech? And you can't think of it that way because the Big 12 is an absolute gauntlet. And so I think we're ahead of schedule. I think we're in a great spot resume-wise for the tournament, which is obviously you want to continue to build that resume because that's the, that's the goal is to make to the tournament, advance to the second weekend, and this is a team that I think Sure. Now, Jer- maybe, you, maybe you agree with me. I don't, I don't know if we've had this conversation, but typically – Let's have it now. Let's do it. Typically – like, just the way basketball is, and at BYU, there will be some wins on the schedule where you're like, didn't expect that. And then there will be a loss where we're like, oh, man, I didn't expect that. To me, it's the Cincinnati loss. That's un- that was unexpected. And then the Iowa State win. And not, even, not only that, but how they did it. Yes, I, I agree with that because Iowa State uh, is net 10 still. That's the best win of the season. Uh, what, what's the best one of the season to you, Dom? I mean, I got to say, yeah, I, I think Iowa State, you know, I, I think what's crazy is you watch these games and it, it's the way that they did. It's the way they did it against Texas, the way they did it against Iowa State. And I think that, you know, the, we just, we cause a lot of problems for teams. And to be able to do that against a really good defensive team like Iowa State, I think that was the statement win, win of the year. And BYU in both those games was really efficient with uh, fouls and free throws. This is something we've been watching. It's hard not to foul in a physical, athletic league like this. And it's hard to get to the free throw line. But we saw in both those games a different way to win. It wasn't, well, hopefully we just make a bunch of threes. Listen, any, any pathetic team could just walk into a game and go, well, hopefully we make a bunch of threes. BYU is much more skilled than that. What, how many versions of BYU do you feel like they have to where, okay, they're not relying on this one way to win? Yeah, so I, I think the three-point line is going to be our bread and butter, obviously. We're going to shoot it at a high level. We have really skilled guys that can space the floor, which is just causing so many problems for teams. We're unlike any other team in the Big 12, which I think is one of our biggest strengths. You know, I can't imagine a scout team for a team trying to run our actions and think, like, this is how it's going to feel in a game against BYU. And so I think one of the most impressive things is how they're able to close out games. And in the Big 12 and in any conference win, it's going to be a grind. It's going to be a challenge. And so to be able to get you there with the three-point line and then in the end of games figure out ways to win on the defensive side of the, of the ball, rebounding the ball, those are the most impressive things for me, and those were things that we would focus on as, as a, as, you know, when I was playing. So. Dalton Nixon is with us on BYU Sports Nation, former BYU basketball standout. 
We're also discussing good record in February, and uh, the metrics say that BYU has an 80% chance or better in four of the eight approaching games in February, and 70% or better in five of the eight, and then some coin, like coin flip games, including at Oklahoma. So what would be a good record in those eight games, given that BYU is going to be the favorite in the majority of those? Yeah, I mean, four and four, I'm happy with. Five and three, I think we can. You know, I, I like Jerem's eight and oh, you know. Why are, why, are we playing, why are we playing games we don't think we're going to win? Let's go! <laughs> no, I think, I, I think this, is a, uh, you know, this is a group that, you know, they stay healthy. They continue to play the way they can. Uh, five and three would be tremendous looking at this record. Um, and, and so it's going to be a lot of fun. There's going to be challenges. There's going to be hiccups, bumps in the road. Like you said, it's how can you respond after a loss? How can you respond after a big win? That's what's going to get them through, and it's going to be game by game. Playing in the WCC, that was, that, that was what you did when, when you had it, right? This group seems to be, like, uh, growing before our eyes in terms of, like, matching the competition, matching the level. Where and, and how are you seeing BYU grow as a program to meet the need now being in this league? Yeah, so, I mean, when you think about going into the Big 12, I think everyone was just like, uh, we don't really know what to expect. We don't know how good the league is. We don't know how tough these road games are. Um, for us to be able to be where we're at right now in January, I think that we've grown so much in a, in a month. And it's like, how, you know, where can we be in another month? And I think that just has to be from game to game. You're going to see these kids grow. And it's really exciting to see because the coaches are going to continue to get better. Our players are going to continue to get better. And so I just think we're in a really good spot to do some damage towards the back half of this conference. It's wild because... BYU is one player that's getting any kind of draft buzz. There's no, I don't know that there's a first-team all-conference guy on the team, maybe not even a second. It is a great team, and you're seeing Dallin Hall, super young still. We just assume he's this been-there guy. It's the middle of his sophomore year. Like it, It's fun to see these guys grow together and uh, compete really high. Dalton Nixon again with us on BYU Sports Nation. Let's talk about maybe some similarities that you see with this team compared to some of the good teams that you played on, specifically that 2019-2020 squad that featured yourself and Jake Toulson, Yoli Childs, T.J. Haas, the sharpshooting Zach Selyus, who's got that He's beautiful now got a mullet, mullet going Germany. right now, yeah, just, just knocking down threes. <laughs> so what similarities do you see between your team and this year's BYU basketball team? So I think offensively it's a similar team where they have really skilled players. Um, the space, there's so much space on the floor. You just see that. They just cause so many problems for teams because you've got five guys that can shoot the ball. You've got five guys that can dribble, pass, and shoot. And I think that's what is, was similar to our team, even though we were probably a little bit more undersized. Um, one of the things that I think that I'm jealous of is, you know, our team was experienced. We were older. But you look at this team, and, I mean, they've grown so much in the last month that it's like that experience just in those seven Big 12 games, like that's so valuable. And so um, I just think that, the, you know, they have the, the, the core group of, of leadership coming together. They shoot the ball so well. They're learning how to win as a team. And those are the things that I think were really similar to, to the groups that I played with. Feels like that group maybe had a few more kind of one-on-one uh, -on -one guys, TJ and uh, Jake specifically, that at the end of the shot clock could probably make a play. Right now, BYU is kind of – doesn't have, like, that dude per se. Dawson Baker might have been that guy. Um, but they've had to overcome some stuff. I do want to ask, is there a day that goes by that you don't think about what if with the COVID cancellation of March Madness? Because that one, that one hurts. It's like, what would 2011 – Brandon Davies with BYU have done, and what would 2020 have, have done? It, it hurts to think about it. The, the funny thing is, is, you know, life goes on. And, Does you it? Know, we're, it goes on. <laughs> I know it doesn't go on for you guys because you're still here. You guys are still here. But, we're still you know, here. believe it or not, we've all, you know, everyone from my team, we've got, kind of gone on with our lives. But the funny thing is, is you talk to fans all the time, oh, and man. they come up and they're like, your group, you know, and, and so I mean, like, I'll just say, yeah, we were, we were a final four team. Yeah. It's, it was COVID's fault. Right now. But I mean, it, it, that was a group that was really special. We've done a lot of cool things to be able to see that go into the tournament, but I mean, it is what it is. And now we have another great team to support here at BYU. And, and so now these guys are up next. I, I wanted a more bitter response there. <laughs> I, I needed, it grinds my, day. no, it just would have been, you guys playing like a top 10 team at the time. Because the first nine, you're always out for the dumb paperwork stuff. You're playing so hot. You beat Gonzaga. We've forgotten about the St. Mary's game right after. Whatever. Flush it up. You go to the NCAA tournament and the nation's top three-point shooting team. Could have gone to that second weekend for the third time ever. 
But we haven't thought about Think, it. Yeah, we have. <laughs> I haven't thought, but I haven't thought about it. Again, I've moved on. I've totally moved on. Totally got other yes. jobs. Yeah, so nice totally over it. To oh, wait. <laughs> that, that level of depression has been uh, rarely touched when it comes to BYU sports in my life. For sure. <sighs> a little, a little like, sensitive. Oh, okay. A little, little tender. We'll, we'll finish with this. If you had to pick a player on this year's roster that you think is the Dalton Nixon of BYU basketball, who, who is it on this year's squad? This is an easy pick for me. Richie Saunders, he's been one of my favorite players all year. I just love the edge that he plays with. I love the energy that he brings. That was me and Zach Selyus coming off the bench, you know, just doing anything that you can to help your team win. So Richie's my guy. And coming off the Richie Saunders flu game where he just <laughs> knocks down his first three after not practicing for Amazing. three days. Amazing. He's been so good. He's been amazing. Dalton, it's great to have you back in studio. Thanks for coming man. in, man. Yeah, thank you. It's good, good to see you. Glad things are going well. Come hang out again, okay? Oh, let's do it. Let's do it again. Let's talk more basketball. Okay, check out BYU Basketball with Mark Pope. Trey Stewart's the guest. Coming up tonight, 830 Eastern on the BYU TV app. I'm in the film room with Noah Waterman. After the break, we've discussed men's basketball at length and how they graded out in January and projections for February. But what about the women's team? What do we think? Same questions asked about the women's team. Stay with us. BYU Sports Nation is presented by the BYU Store, official outfitter of BYU fans everywhere. Follow BYU Sports Nation on social media, Facebook, X, Instagram, YouTube, and TikTok. Welcome back to Studio B. I am Spencer. He is Jerem. Let's roll out your Thursday headlines. BYU football's Keaton Slovis, Isaac Rex, and Ryan Rico will be competing in the Shrine Bowl game today in Frisco, Texas at 8 Eastern on NFL Network. We'll talk to Justin Anderson in a moment who visited not only the Shrine Bowl but the Senior Bowl to see the BYU Cougs out participating in these college all-star games. Los Angeles Rams wide receiver Puka Nakua is done watching his LeBron highlights and will compete (laughs) in the Pro Bowl games which begin today with the skills showdown. Can't wait to see his personality on display there. Puka will be the lone former Cougar participating because 49ers linebacker Fred Warner is obviously preparing for another shot at a Super Bowl. He's a little busy, apparently. Women's basketball lost 67-53 at Kansas last night despite a bat being on the court. Kaylee Wilson had a new career high, 26 points in the loss, although the Cougars shot 11 of 41. UAU now 2-7 in the league, 12-10 overall. West Virginia and Provo Saturday. It is a West Virginia weekend. Gymnastics Friday in Provo, and then both basketball teams playing West Virginia Saturday. And gymnastics and men's basketball should frankly win those matchups. We'll see about women's basketball. It's a good team. BYU's Jackson Robinson, featured in any recent NBA mock draft on nbadraft.net, going in the first round, 25th overall pick to the Denver Nuggets. That would be awesome. Wow. Cougars and the pros, who are already there. Zach Selyus, talked about him with Dalton Nixon. Good. He and the mullet scored 21 points on 7 of 11 shooting from the three-point line, had nine rebounds for the Wiesberg Baskets in Germany. Yoli Childs averaged 11 points and 6 rebounds over his last three games this week for the Saga Ballooners in Japan. (laughs) What's the mascot? I got some questions there. Brandon Davies averaged 13 points and 5 rebounds over two games this week for Valencia Basket in Spain. Still doing his thing at a very high level in EuroLeague. Matt Harms, remember him? Scored 13 points, 6 rebounds for Zunder Palencia also in Spain. And Brandon Averett with 23 points for the Etoile Angers in France. Let's go. Softball's Violet Zavodnik and Hunter Ava were featured in two preseason player rankings. Zavodnik was ranked the 74th best player in America, 18th best outfielder in the country by Softball America. And Ava was ranked as the 13th best corner infielder by D1 Softball. And BYU men's and women's swim and dive both competing in the Air Force Invitational beginning today and going through, competing at Air Force rather, beginning today and running through the weekend. Good luck to those BYU teams. Those are today's headlines. Now some opinions in the whip. The Cook Whip Round presented by Marist, your e-commerce logistics shipping partner. Is women's hoops ahead but behind or on schedule through the first month of Big 12 play? This seems a little bit behind, but only by one game. Agreed. Yeah, I, I think BYU should have three wins. They don't. And that's unfortunate because they've been in some games that, frankly, they probably should have won. The one at Kansas State just crushes me because Kansas State lost to Oklahoma last night. It would have been something if BYU could have been the team to hand them their first They were beatable. Yeah, Yeah. for sure. One game behind schedule. Yeah, it's hard not to imagine this team with Nani Falatea who left the team midseason. And it just really hurts. It's really affected this team, I think. No question. They're young. They're growing. They're getting better. But it's Lauren Gustin's last year trying to take advantage of them. Yeah, with Nani and Ari in the mix – 
I think BYU. I always forget Ari in that. Sorry, and no. you bring her up. She's a big piece that tore ACL preseason as well. I think BYU might be two games better than they are in Big 12 play specifically with those two players. It's hard to imagine this team with them because it would have been pretty good. Man. For sure. All right, how does West Virginia men's basketball beating Cincinnati on their home floor last night impact your expectations for what BYU is going to do against the Mountaineers on Saturday? With Jesse Edwards back, it's like, wow, this is going to be a tough game to win despite the net ranking of the Mountaineers, which yes. is 100 plus. It is a tough game regardless of whether they beat Cincinnati or not. With him in the lineup, it goes from if I'm like an odds maker I'm like okay BYU probably by eight or nine now it's like maybe BYU by two like that, that big of a swing I, he wow. just wow. road environment and with the insurgence of some really important players from for West Virginia they feel like a totally different team yeah they, they're totally different at home and road too okay Violet Zavodnik ranked 74th best players mentioned 18th best outfielder um what was but was left off the preseason all big 12 team is that a miss? Should she have been on it? Normally I'd say, yeah, that's a miss, but this conference still has Oklahoma and Texas. <laughs> Oklahoma's won three natties in a row, and, like, it hasn't been close, so it's hard to make it. Yeah. It's so difficult to be on that list because of the powerhouse conference that it is. It's the best softball conference in America. There you go. Plus so, preseason, I'd rather it be on the postseason one. For sure. If you're going to miss one, miss the preseason. It feels a little bit like Lauren Gustin being left off the preseason. She'll be on all the big She'll she, be on the postseason. I think Violet could be in postseason. She has a great season. There we she go. could do it. All right, that wraps up the whip. And that, as a reminder, after the break, uh, we'll chat with BYU Football Director of Player Personnel Justin Anderson about BYU's guys at the Shrine and Senior Bowls. Some guys with pro dreams trying to put something on their resumes. This is BYU Sports Nation. Is Rico a draft pick, by the way? This portion of BYU Sports Nation is presented by Maersk, your e-commerce logistics shipping partner. BYU Sports Station. We're hanging out live in Studio B. He is Jerem Jordan. I'm Spencer Linton. Let's welcome in the BYU Football Director of Player Personnel, Justin Anderson, for a few reasons. Because another signing day is right around the corner, uh, Wednesday, February 7th. Also, I want to talk about some guys that are trying to pursue their pro dreams at different All-Star games. Justin, welcome back to the show. Great to be back. You were just hanging out with Kingsley Suomataia as yeah. uh, he gets ready for the Reese's Senior Bowl. What was that experience like to be there with Kingsley? And How's he feeling about the approaching draft and, and what he has to do in terms of work before the draft? Yeah, so I got there uh, really the first day of practices, and I thought he represented himself well. He played, I mean, from the individual work to the one-on-ones to the teamwork, I thought he did a great job. So I think he's put himself in good position. You know, you're seeing a lot of really good players. That's the nice thing is you're competing against really good players. Like, these are guys that you expect to be drafted and play on Sundays, so I think you get to see where you're at, and I think he did really well. What's it like to kind of walk around, and I'm sure you're feeling questions from uh, GMs and player personnel guys from NFL teams? Yeah, I think it's, um, you know, a lot of questions. They, they want to know background type stuff, you know, character, work ethic, that kind of deal. And the nice thing about BYU is those are usually pretty easy questions for us. We, have, we really do have a great group of kids and the guys that are trying to make it to the draft. It's been easy, easy How, conversation for with sure. those guys. How much do you have to set? Like, obviously, BYU wants to have high-level draft picks. The more first-round draft picks, the better. So how much of an opportunity do you have to be like, oh, yeah, like, we're, we're putting all these guys in the NFL. You're pointing out the, the big-time draft picks. How much of an opportunity do you have to do that with guys as you try and help better the status of your players that are competing in these games? Yeah, I think it's – I think when you get a reputation of, of having guys that have success. So BYU, I think not only they put guys in the, in the NFL, but I think the guys that do go have had good, good success, which I think – is a really big selling point as you're talking to young men. Hey, we can help develop you to get there. But the reality is most of these kids have the innate traits, right? You're looking for part of the reason I like to go to these com- the combines and the NFL uh, bowl games is you get to see, like, body types. What do they look like? What do they move like? And so, um, you know, Kingsley, he, you can tell he fits in. He doesn't look like a fish out of water. So, um, yeah, I think it's good. I think it's an easy selling point for us where we can say, hey, you know, look at this guy, look at that guy. Look, this guy was drafted in this round. We're able to put guys not only in the draft, but then they're going to play at a high level. Specifically at left tackle, this is going to be BYU's third straight starting left tackle who's going to get drafted, Correct. which is big time. Um, and, and so what, what does that mean to the program? Obviously, quarterback's the 
most high-profile position. But left tackle might be the second best uh, position to be putting in the league. I, mean, I think it's obviously a very important position. I mean, position guys are drafted at a high level, and and that's a very valuable position in the NFL. I mean, I think that's one of those positions nowadays that you see. You could see four or five tackles get drafted in the first round, sometimes more, because people are looking for guys that can play that edge to protect against these defensive ends. Man, when you you know at these bowl games, you see some of these defensive ends. I mean, they are they are twitchy. Justin Anderson is with us on BYU Sports Nation. All right, let's talk about the Shrine Bowl because Isaac Rex, Keaton Slovis, Ryan Rico, all there competing, doing their thing, trying to increase and improve their own draft profiles. Uh, so let's just, let's just start with Isaac. Like, where where is Isaac uh, when it comes to an NFL potential, and, and how have you seen him develop from the season end to where he is now? Yeah, I think being healthy for him has been been key. You know, I think he had a whole healthy off season from the ankle surgery. I think he had a great season. The great thing about Isaac's he's been productive. So you say all you want, he's productive, and I think that that matters in the NFL. Production matters. And he does have the measurables. So I think he's done a good job of putting himself in a good position to, to have an opportunity to play the next Hey, a one-handed catch for a touchdown doesn't hurt either. Yeah, and then, then in the beautiful. games, he's yeah. playing well. And then he made it to the BYU-UCF basketball game right after that, which was also fun. <laughs> like, they were playing on campus. He made it to the game, which was super cool. And he's been in multiple games, which is good. Good exposure. Yes. Talk to me about Keaton Slovis, because obviously the numbers weren't what he wanted at Pitt and then at BYU. Yet he's got some of the, the goods that NFL – uh, general managers want and whatnot. Hopefully he can get an undrafted free agent opportunity. What, what's the conversation around him right now? Yeah, I think, you know, the nice thing about Keaton is, is he's played in different systems, so you know he can learn a system really quickly, which in the NFL is a big deal. Um, and he has a really good arm. And in the NFL, those things matter a lot, a lot more than people, I think, realize is this ability to throw the ball yeah. at a high level and arm strength, and he has those, those tools. So I think he's done a good job, and He's a really good kid. He's got good character. He showed some leadership for us. And those, sure. those things at that position are really important, to be able to show leadership. Now that we're done with the season, we're looking back on Keaton Slovis' BYU days, how, how much light can you shed on just what he was dealing with injury-wise and, and other challenges-wise while he was at BYU for this one year? Yeah, and I, you know, the thing about Keaton is I thought he handled everything like such a pro. And I think that says a lot about his character and why he was voted a captain by the, by the team is it's frustrating to be injured, um, but his desire to kind of be back and help the team, it, that never lacked. It was never like, I'm done. It was like, what can I do to get back? And so he worked to get back the best that he could, and it just unfortunately didn't work out to where he was. But he's healthy now, and he's throwing. He's in these bo- the, you know, the full game and having a chance to show himself. And then we'll have the pro day coming up, the Big 12 pro day, where yep. these guys are going to have a chance to do that again. So. Every little opportunity to present yourself to these guys is important. And I think our guys are doing a great job. The ones that have had a chance so far are representing themselves very well. It's hard to make it as a specialist, but Ryan Rico's got a real shot here. Yeah, he really does. I mean, he's got a big leg. He's a big kid. And, um, you know, that punter and kicker is always hard because those guys last forever in the league. So, it, so some of it is timing. Do you, are you coming out at the right time? And I, I feel like he's – if there's a team that needs a punter – if they take him, they won't regret it because he has an NFL league. We need a BYU guy in the league, specifically at punter, just so Pat McAfee has, like, a direct source <laughs> to not only BYU, but, like, a punter from BYU. Yes. Right. That's right. He needs more BYU content, if you know what I mean. He needs different content. Yes, he does. Our friend Ryan Smith said as much. It's yeah. time for new content. Maybe that's Ryan Rico as a punter yes. with BYU. Signing day is next Wednesday in – we see the writing on the wall. December is the big day now. Yeah. It just, it's be, like That's become the real signing day. But technically, the first Wednesday in February is also signing day. Yeah. So what can you tell us about what to expect uh, a week from now? Will, will there be any surprises or, or some, you know, some things that are off the radar that we'll find out next week? I mean, Wednesday? I think we'll, have, we'll, we'll sign a few, few more guys, likely. It won't be very big. Um, but I think they're really key pieces and, re- and very good players. So I think it'll be exciting to add to our group because I feel like our coaches did a really good job of targeting the right guys that we're looking for to build the roster and um, yeah I'm excited about the group of guys that have signed and the, the few guys that will sign now and you know you'll always be because of the changing world if guys leave you got to be looking for transfer portal positions so we'll always be kind of watching that to see what pops up if there's a guy that can really help your team then you always go that but the, you know this year we did not get into that quite as much we yeah. didn't need we didn't need to yeah, and you're saying perhaps post-spring if a need arises? Yeah. Gotcha. 
You feel better about the BYU's relationship with the transfer portal this year overall? Yeah, I think, you know, it's like it's such a changing dynamic because you've got to fill needs, and sometimes if you really need a guy to step in and play right away, it's tough sometimes to go to that high school route, and that's where the transfer portal kind of is needed. And last year we, we lost a lot of guys, so we kind of needed to jump into that. And the nice thing is we got some guys with multiple years that mm-hmm. were in the portal, mm-hmm. which ideally I think you want to do because then you can kind of build some continuity and stuff like that. So I think we've done that, and I think I feel really good about the roster we've got coming back. All right. I, I have to ask this. It's totally unrelated to anything we've been talking about, but you were a speedster. You still work out a ton. Okay. How many guys have you lined up and raced on the, the 120 <laughs> guys? Of the 120 oh, guys geez. that are BYU football players right now. I could a few of them. How, How many, many linemen you could you be, Justin? <laughs> <laughs> if I can't beat our linemen, I probably am I'm in trouble. I, I know I can beat our linemen, that's nice. for sure. You're still sub 540. Let's go. Yeah, I can get, I can get below five seconds for sure. Let's, Let's go. go. Yeah. I, I knew a guy one time that claimed he could. I, I claimed, not, claimed he could, but he did not. You know, I've, I've seen that <laughs> clip before. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, we need to, you need to, you need to do, 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 do give me the speed training. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I, I need hey, you doc, to Dr. help Main, me. Dr. Doc Main's got you. Gotcha. <laughs> Best mustache in the game. Yep. Let's go. Uh, thanks, Justin. Great well, to thanks, talk Justin. to you. Good to see you, man. Okay. Gymnastics taking on West Virginia. First home Big 12 meet in the history of Cougar Gymnastics. Coming up tomorrow night, 9 Eastern on Big 12 Now on ESPN+. Love it. At the Marriott Center. Up next, we'll wrap up today's show with the top five wins over Texas all time at BYU on the heels of another big win against the Longhorns. Did Saturday's win make the cut? This is BYU Sports Nation. Horns inverted? Is that what you said? (laughs) BYU Sports Nation is presented by the BYU Store, official outfitter of BYU fans everywhere. Welcome back to BYU Sports Nation. It's time for Top 5 Tuesday featuring the top five BYU wins over Texas all time, which make the cut across all sports. Jerem, start us off. We go way back for number five to Saturday. BYU spins basketball win over Texas 82 or 84-72. Foo, 16 points in 17 minutes. BYU shot 64% from the field. That was a much-needed win and a big-time win in the only meeting between these two as Big 12 teams in the regular season. All right, basketball starts us off. Football in at number four, but which win over the Longhorns by football? Because there have been plenty. We go 2014 at Darrell K. Royal Memorial Stadium. The Longhorns were ranked 25th in the country. Not for long. Then the Taysom leap happened. Taysom Hill led BYU with 280 yards of total what? offense, three rushing touchdowns, and that iconic highlight. BYU destroys so Texas 41-7. Adam Pena was amazing in that game. Number three, women's volleyball, 2018. Elite eight, four seed BYU hosting five seed Texas in the Smithfield House. Second largest crowd in program history. It's one of my best memories there. So good. Ronnie Jones Perry, 25 kills. Copper Hills represent. BYU swept the Longhorns to go to the Final Four. Number two, back to football. This time BYU hosting Texas. And we'll call this the Manny Diaz game. Taysom Hill runs for 259 259! And three touchdowns. The ball was 182. BYU upsets the 15th-ranked Longhorns, 40-21. to 21. BYU ran for a school record 550 yards that night. Paul Lasique, Kyle Van Noy. There were so many NFL players in that game. It was awesome. Number one, women's volleyball 2014. In the final yes. four, BYU's unseeded, taking down two-seed overall Texas to advance to the national championship game. Jennifer Hampson, Alexa Gray combined for 41 kills. BYU won in four sets. And that mustache of Sean Oh, it's so good. Was so, so It's good. so yeah. great to see smiling Sean Olmstead with that stash. Bring it back, Sean, at some point. Oh, fantastic. On to our question of the day. What would be a good record for BYU men's basketball in the month of February? Our elite voice of the day from Grizz Father on X, who says the schedule was supposedly easier Yet we see night in and night out, there aren't many gimme wins. So I'd say five and three. I agree with you, Grizz Father. Okay. It would be a good month. Got to go at least four and four, which is what Jerem said. And anything yeah. above five and three is a bonus and would make it a really good month. That'd be awesome. In response, again, that was our Elite Voice Day presented by PAX Healthcare Elevated. Now today's Rise and Shout Out presented by Mountain America, the official credit union of BYU Athletics. Yeah, the uh, Shrine guys, the East-West Shrine game, uh, big-time opportunity for BYU guys on NFL Network tonight at 8 Eastern to showcase themselves. Keaton Slovis, Isaac Rex, Ryan Rico. Uh, get it done tonight. Get yourself on the map a little bit, and let's see what they can't do in NFL camps. Can Puka win the uh, skills competition too? 
Just, oh, yeah, and that. The dream season continues. Honestly, that's interesting. I won't be watching that much. I'll watch the highlights on Twitter. He tweeted out, let me fanboy for a minute. He was talking about being around all these great players yes. at the Pro Bowl. That'll be fun. You, Puka, you can fanboy all you want, man. I'm working for the Sixers tonight. I'm going to be busy, oh. but uh, all good. <laughs> so I had a Joel Embiid for He's me. not playing. He's oh, not even going to be there. He's playing. Uh, thanks to today's guest, Dalton Nixon and Austin, or Justin Anderson. Sorry, Dennis. For Jeremiah Spencer, shout out to Kevin Nixon. We'll see you tomorrow for BYU Sports Nation. Go Cougs. Whether you're planning a simple backyard party or a large event, Diamond Event and Tent has exactly what you need. From tables, chairs, and linens to tents, dance floors, and stages, Diamond has an amazing inventory to choose from and a professional staff that will help you pull it all together. Diamond Event and Tent serves the entire Wasatch Front, and you can either pick up your party rental items or have them delivered. Visit diamondevent.com.